Hey there, Vibe Church. Welcome to our podcast. Today we have the final installment in our series called Christian. And we're going to be unpacking freedom in Christ. I really hope God speaks to you through this message. God bless. Today we are going to close out our series called Christian. Are you ready for the Word of God? Well, if you're ready, grab a Bible, stay standing. I want to read to you from a passage of Scripture. Last week, I I did something different and uh, we wrote on the iPad and I got so much positive feedback. Thank you. I don't know if it was encouragement or positive feedback, but, but I took your encouragement as license to do it again. So today we're going to be turning to Acts chapter 8. Verse 1, if you want to go there in your Bible real quick, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. We have been squarely pictured in this passage of the Bible here all throughout this series so far as we've been really looking at the Christians, the early church, when they were first called Christians. And we learn already that the early church, it was good for the early church in Jerusalem. They enjoyed the benefits of being in the body of believers. They shared everything. No one lacked anything. The power of God was there. Holy Spirit was poured out. People were discovering their gifts. It was good to be in the early church all the way up to at least Acts chapter 8. And here we see the killing of Stephen. It says in verse 1, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims. And many who'd been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Week one of this series, we... We looked at what it is to be marked by God, to be identified with Christ, the fact that He has called you by name, that as a Christian, you get to bear the name of Christ. What a privilege it is to carry the mark and the call of Jesus Christ. Week two, we looked at not just Christ identifying with us, but us identifying with Christ. And the Velvet Hammer, my wife, she preached a sermon. She knocked it out of the park, talking about baptism. And then last week, we looked at what makes us distinctly Christian. A distinct mark of a Christian is always consistently uh, being connected to Christ, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, remaining in Him. Today I thought what would be good to bring this series full circle is not just to know what it is to be a Christian, but I thought we could talk about this. What am I meant to do? How many people think that would be handy? Especially if you came in today saying, I love the teaching, I love the understanding, I love learning about being a Christian, but, but I'd love to know what to do. Out of all the things I could do, out of the many things I should do, what is the one thing as a Christian I am meant to do? How many people think that would be helpful by the time we're done today? Fantastic, you are in the right place. And to prepare your hearts for the Word of God, would you find four people around you and give them a big hug and say, thank you for sitting next to me. Do it real quick, do it real quick. Thank you for sitting next to me. Thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. Be thankful. Be thankful. Amen. Anybody ever found themselves in a situation where they have no idea what to do? Situation where you find that you got the place or you got the position, but you've been faking it the whole time. No, just me. Okay, well, I've done this many times throughout my life, and you'd think I would learn my lesson. In fact, the time that it actually happened the most severe was when I was, I was wanting so badly to get married to Kira, and I was an apprentice electrician at the time. I was studying Bible college at night. I was doing electrical training, and I was still an apprentice. And And I I wanted to get married to her, but you cannot get married on apprenticeship wage. You you can't do that, okay? You you gotta you gotta provide, you gotta be a husband, you know, you gotta be the man. And so 
I thought, man, there is one solution to this because one solution was not waiting for my four-year apprenticeship to be up. Uh, I was just barely starting year two. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and just find a job. I'm just going to look in the... This was back in the old days where you would actually look in the newspaper at job listings, okay? And so you'd flip through the newspaper, you'd see a job listing, and it's, uh, jobs were for qualified electricians. I thought, what qualifies somebody? You know, so I just applied. And, uh, and I remember, and I won't give you the big details of this interview, but I applied for this one position because it had a very good salary, it had a company car, and a cell phone. Like a company cell phone. Like this is back in the day where I was used to stopping at, at, at a phone booth. Sorry, Vive Youth, you have no idea what they are. It's a phone that was situated with a cord to it and was permanent. And, and this is where you would go and you would dial up your next client or your next customer and you'd make sure they were home before you drove all the way out there. You know what I mean? And so, and so this job came with a cell phone and it came with a company car, which was a truck full of tools. Okay. But nonetheless, it had a great salary. I remember, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but long story short, I got hired. And it got, wasn't on my qualifications, it was on my character. It was on the fact that he said, you know what, I like you, we could hang out, you're hired. I thought, this is the greatest job ever. And, and for the first week, it was phenomenal. I remember that it was just pretty easy, you know, getting, you know, the tr- like getting in, into, the, into the run of things and, you know, just getting acclimated into the uh, position. And I remember the week two, I was put on the emergency call roster. That simply means that you had to be on 24-hour call, that if a breakdown happened or there was an emergency situation, they had to call you. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was was a little bit nervous. I was thinking, what happens if someone actually calls? Like, (laughs) I don't know what to do. But for the first few days, it was fine. The phone didn't even ring. I'm getting paid double time and a half for being on call and doing nothing. I thought, the the Lord's favor goes before the Lord's anointed. (laughs) He provides. Until night three, <laughs> when an emergency call came in, and I, I honestly considered whether I answer it, you know, but then I realized I'm, I'm the guy. And so I remember going out to this apartment complex, and in the middle of the night it was storming, and the power had gone out, and they needed an emergency fix. And I was like, oh, great. Okay, so I'm, I'm there on site, and I can remember uh, the, the guy was there, and he, he's like, uh, where do you want to start? And I said, you know, I'd, I'd love to assess the situation. And, uh, and he's like, do you want to start in the electrical room? I said, yes, that's where I'd love to start. Actually, let's start there. Because I didn't know. He knew more than me, believe it or not. And I remember going in. It wasn't just an electrical cupboard. It was a whole electrical room. So that was perfect for me because I could shut the door and hide in there. I remember standing in there thinking, what on earth do I do? It's dark. I had a flashlight on. And I'm like, what do I do? I, I remember walking around. And there were, I'm telling you, there were tools I didn't even know how to use. So I took some of these tools I didn't know how to use, and I started banging things to make it sound like I was fixing something. (laughs) But while I'm banging things, I'm praying. Man, my prayer life went to a whole new level. You thought I could pray at Bible college. I prayed as an electrician. I'm on my knees. I'm like, God, just do something. I will never fake it again. I will will be authentic Christian. I will not lie. And as I'm praying this, I can't even make this up. All of a sudden, all the lights in the electrical room came on. I put my head out of the cupboard. The lights in the hallway are on. The whole place is working. I get my tools together. I kind of hurry before it turns off again. And, and I get out there. And, and the guy's like, you did it. What, what was it? I said, oh, it's just technical stuff. It's all fixed. You, you'll be fine from here. <laughs> How many people have ever faked it before? You, you, you feel like you faked it in some situation in life. I wonder how many Christians do the same. Oh, <laughs> that hit. Like, I wonder how many of us learn the things and we sit here and we get great teaching on Sunday in, Sunday out, and yet it's all head knowledge but no practical application. It's like we've sat in a classroom in a seminary, but if I was to put it into practice, I think I'd be in the situation on my knees saying, God, what do I do? I know who I am. I'm a Christian. But what do I do? This is a great question for us to ask. Because I think what I'm meant to do, we already know that. We already know that. Let let me take a poll and, and say, how many people would agree that probably what you're meant to do is you're meant to get, uh, let's, let's put it up here, get more people, yeah, this is going to be fun, more people into heaven. If I can break it down 
really simply. How many people think you meant to get more people into heaven? This is an interactive sermon. Do not sit there blankly. If you agree, you can put your hand up. If you disagree, keep your hand down. Let me say it again. How many people think you meant to get more people into heaven? Hands raised. You're all wrong. Okay. <laughs> it's not right. It's kind of right. I'll give you half a point. I love being a teacher. It's so good. You get half a point. Half a mark. 0.5. Not a full point. In fact, what you need to understand, and probably a good place to start if we really want to know what I'm meant to do as a Christian, is probably start with Jesus. Who would agree with that? Because Jesus really makes it clear and very plain in Scripture what He was called to do. We're going to find that, in fact, in Luke chapter 4. I hope you're going to take your own notes today. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 to 19. This is the passage of Scripture that clearly articulates from Jesus what He was called to do after He was baptized in the Jordan River. He went out into the wilderness, coming out of the wilderness. It says this in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. We learned that last week, that it was so good. The power of the Holy Spirit came on Jesus. Then He began to minister in power. It says, Reports about Him spread quickly throughout the whole region. Next verse. He taught regularly there in, in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. They were big fans of Jesus. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the Scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet that was, was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Next verse. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. This is Jesus' mission on earth. Jesus said, the very reason I came, and He uses a a prophecy to explain it. In fact, every part of Jesus' life fulfilled some ancient prophecy. Did you know that? Yet he used the prophet of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah, to say, hey, what, prophet, what Isaiah was prophesying is being filled today in your midst, but this is what I came to do. And if I came to do it, you should do it too. Yeah. This should be your mission. You should not have a different mission than Jesus' mission. How many people agree that if Jesus had that mission, we should have that mission? So it's very, in fact, it's very clear what we are meant to do. What is not so clear, I have found, is how we're meant to do it. Yeah. Like, like what Jesus just articulated, that's great. Preach, proclaim, set people free. But how? How do I, how do, I do that? How do I do that? Well, good news for you, the Bible gives us a roadmap or a description for how we're meant to do what God calls us to do. The Bible is so cool. The Bible is, the Bible, if you don't love your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, come see me. I will make sure I find someone rich to buy you a Bible. Okay, and uh, I'll give you one Akira. She's got so many of them. I know how she reads them all. She's got them everywhere. She's got them in a nightstand. She's got them in a car. She's got them everywhere. Bible's everywhere. But the Bible is living and active. The Bible is not dead, dormant, or deceased. The Bible is not something that is antiquated. The Bible is living and active. Even though it's a historical text and a historical account, it is living and active today, meaning that every time you go to the Word of God, God can breathe new life into your soul. If you want to get direction from God, the good place to start is the Word of God. And the Word of God gives us a, a description or, or an idea of what we're meant to do and how we're meant to do it. In fact, the disciples were asking the same question that you were asking. How do we do this? How do we do this? We see what you do, Jesus. We see the power that you minister in, but how do we do this? And there's a beautiful passage in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, in fact, where Jesus is ministering and the disciples are seeing him do some incredible things. And Jesus, they've been rolling with Jesus for a little bit, so he really wanted to see where their revelation level was at. Like, do they, are they fully aware of actually what's going on? And so they ask, he asked them this, and check it out. It says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. There were the rumors going around. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, 
that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is a great passage of Scripture that actually frames what it is or what do I do? What do I do? In fact, let's go ahead and just uh, unpack this for a moment. Because here we've got Jesus saying some pretty cool statements. Firstly, he says this, Upon this rock, I will build my church. This is great news for any church builders out there that you thought you were doing this all on your own, that you thought that you were building the church. But Jesus here clearly says that I will build my church and upon it the gates of hell will not prevail. I hope you're going to bear with my illustrative techniques here today. But here he's got this idea of the church, the church that we come to, the church that we build. And he says something very special. He says, on this rock, this this rock, this rock, which was not Peter. Peter is not the rock. Even though he was hard-headed, he was not the rock. That's a good joke in none of your... All right, stay away from the church jokes. The church, he said, is built on this rock, which is the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus, this is the rock that the church is built upon, the revelation of who Jesus is as the Messiah. What I love about this passage is Jesus makes it clear that it's not built by you and I, it's built by Jesus. Now, he invites us into partnership to build what he's building, but primarily he is the architect. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of this thing called the church, this church that's built by Jesus. And this is what we are a part of. We are part of the church. The church is not a building. In fact, I've done a whole series on this. You can get it at any time you want on YouTube. But the church is not a building. The church is a body. The church is the people. It's a place of revelation. It's a place of illumination. It's a place where you, God will reveal His gifts and illuminate His gifts and will actually mobilize His gifts. It's a place where power is understood. This is the church. And the church is the body of Christ. Go ahead and write that down. It's the body of Christ. Not only is it the body of Christ, we are being fit together in this body, that we are being built together. Let me go ahead and give you some Bible verses. This is like a seminar today. Are you enjoying this church seminar Sunday? Uh, first, first Corinthians, in fact, if you want to go there, uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 16, or verse 18, I think it is. Uh, did I give you that scripture? There it is, verse 18, yeah. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. That means that when you came here, you may have thought it was random. You may have found an advert to, God, to Vive Church. You might have Googled it. You might have looked for a certain style of church. You thought it was all you. Guess what? It was not you. God was leading you. You found yourself here because He has somewhere He wants to fit you. All right, Benz. God has somewhere He has to fit you. Sometimes we think we just randomly go places. God's like, no, 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 I, I directed that. I illuminated that. There was something about that that got your eye. I, I showed you that so that you would keep, because I have somewhere I want to fit you. He fits us together in the body. We also see this in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That means for the success of Vive Church, we need every part. Though while you're holding your part back, like, you know, I'm just going to check this out a little bit. I'm going to wait until I hear some prosperity message and it's going to be a prosperity church or I'm going to wait and, and just, just check it out from a distance. Well, it's really hard for us to be healthy while you're holding back your part because for the whole body to be healthy, we all need to do our part. That's what the Scriptures say. So this is what the church is. The church is an individual's isolated. The church is the body together. That's what the church is. And that's what Jesus came to build. He came to build us. He came to build us together, bringing people into the body, fitting us together, fixing us up, changing some attitudes and correcting some offenses so that we can actually function together as the body. You staying with me? This is the church. But he goes on to talk about not just the church. He says, and the gates, I like actually, he says this, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell 
It's of Hades. Will not overcome it. He's getting serious language here. And I love that concept because he says the gates of Hades. The gates. I don't know about you. I've never seen gates move. (laughs) Have you? You seen gates move? They're fixed. And so often we walk through life thinking the devil's at me. Like the devil keeps coming to get me. The devil keeps trying to oppress me. The devil keeps coming to corrupt my life and corrupt my kids. But, but Jesus doesn't say that. He says that, he doesn't say the, the gates of heaven will not relent. He says the gates of hell will not prevail or overcome, which means that we are advancing hell, not hell's advancing us. Are, are you with me? This is very, very important foundationally as a believer of faith to know that you are pushing up against hell. Hell isn't pushing up. Hell's on the back foot. If you haven't read the end of the Bible, guess what? There's a cheat code. Go to the end, realize we win. Which means when you came to Christ, you became a part of an advancing army. That the, um, the kingdom of God uh, advances and the violent take it by force. That there is an advancement. So if there is some disturbance in the force of your life, guess what? You've been on the attack since day one. You just haven't realized it. And you've been sitting there saying, the devil took my parking spot and the, the devil did this. Guess what? The devil didn't do none of that. He's on the run from you. You don't want none of that. Okay. (laughs) But he goes on to say this. He says, and I will give you, I will give you, I like that. I will, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, now he contrasts two things. First, he talks about the church. Next, he talks about the kingdom. And the kingdom is different from the church. The kingdom intersects the church and the kingdom works through the church and the church is a part of the kingdom, but you need to understand the difference. And if you would allow me, I would love to unpack for you the difference between the church and the kingdom. Now, what you've got is a king. Jesus is king. Thank you, Kanye. He has illuminated that for everybody who was unaware up until now that we have a king. His name is Jesus. Bear with my drawings. We have a king and this is called the kingdom. You have the church and you have the kingdom. And what we see here is a very clear picture in Scripture that Jesus said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven, we've done a whole series on this too. You can YouTube that as well. But the kingdom of heaven is simply talking about the rule and reign of Jesus. And it's a spiritual kingdom. The disciples were so confused. In fact, the Pharisees were way more confused because they thought Jesus was talking about an earthly kingdom. They thought there was a kingdom that was going to overrun Roman rule. But Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a kingdom that rests in the heart of man. Everybody who has submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ has been brought into the kingdom of heaven. Anybody who is not in the kingdom of heaven is in the kingdom of the world. Did you know that? There's only two kingdoms to be a part of. And it's not that you're a willing participant in the kingdom of the world. You are simply a captive of the world or a captive of the kingdom of darkness. And when you're brought into salvation, you're freed And now you're brought into the kingdom of light. And this is essentially what it is to be in the kingdom. And and the way we bring people into the kingdom is through this passage here. Jesus made it very clear in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Now, I, I plan on telling you exactly what you're called to do, but I have to build a foundation first. Is that okay? I need to make sure before you know what, what to do, you need to know your tools that you got, okay? Like, it's no use having a truck full of fine tools. You don't know anything to use. If you know the tools, you may have an illustration of what you're meant to do, okay? And in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says this, and then he told them, this is Jesus speaking, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Mm, that's cool. Jesus makes it clear. Do this. Go into the world. Don't just stay in church. Don't just teach the good news to each other. Go into your workplace. Go into your families. Go to your barista. Go everywhere you can into all the world and preach the good news of uh, of Jesus, the good news of the kingdom. And this, he he makes sure you know it's, it's good news. This is the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has saved you, redeemed you, that you walk in grace. Okay, so this is the good news. This is, in fact, what he was talking about in Luke 4 at the beginning. After he was baptized, he was talking about how the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim uh, liberty for the captives, to set people free, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. This is a great news. There is freedom in Jesus. Amen. There is freedom. This is what the early church were doing. In fact, in Acts, as we read, they were everywhere they went, they were preaching the good news. They were preaching the good news. They were preaching about freedom 
in Christ. You can write that down. That there is freedom. And it was confusing the thought, oh, like freedom from Roman rule. No, freedom in Christ. This is what it is to preach the good news. And it's shown in two aspects, in fact. Two aspects of this good news was how people are free. People are free in two ways. Free, firstly, and this was the message they were preaching as they were walking out of Jerusalem, that they were free from the penalty of sin. That you were free from the penalty of sin. As they were mobilized, as the persecution came on the church, and they began to push out of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, the surrounding regions, they didn't go quietly. They continued to preach the same thing that got them into trouble in Jerusalem. They just kept preaching that in Judea and Samaria. And what they were preaching was that you are free from the penalty of sin. That before Christ came into your life, the sin that you did had a penalty attached to it. It's very clear. The penalty was death. That's the, that's the, that's the penalty of sin. But because of Jesus, you've now been free from that penalty. Paul talks about this. Probably the most clear passage that articulates this is in Romans 3. Romans 3 verse, uh, what is it, uh, 21 to 26. Put that up there real quick. Let me show you. It says, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty, there it is, for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when He held back and did not punish those who had sinned in times past. For He was looking ahead and including them in what He would do in this present time. Wow, this is, I, I don't even have time. I've got the time ticking away. But this is like a Thanksgiving dinner you can't even begin to eat. It's like you're looking at it and all the goodness and the meat that Paul is talking about here. Let me summarize it real quick for the sake of time. He's saying at the beginning of time when the enemy fell because of pride and he caused a curse on the earth and he led Eve into temptation, man sinned from that moment when they took the bite from the apple or the fruit or the pomegranate or whatever it is in your theology. <laughs> but from that moment we'll condense. But even before that began, long before it, God knew, foreknew that man would fall. So they already enacted a plan that Jesus would be the salvation, that Jesus would enter earth and he would take the penalty of sin for our behalf. And even though the accuser comes to accuse you of what you did, we learned last week that we've got the advocate who's advocating for what Jesus did. And every time the accuser comes to remind you of who you were and what you did, the Holy Spirit is prompting you with memory from Sunday saying, no, but Christ set me free and I learned that I'm free from the penalty of sin. And so there is a powerful interaction that's going on in our mind. We're free from the penalty of sin. Not only are we free from the penalty of sin, Paul wants us to know we're also free from the power of sin. And you're going to find this also in Romans. But in Romans chapter 6, go to Romans chapter 6, verse 5 to 14. And here we see, he writes this, Since... We have been united with Him in His death. We will also be raised to life as He was, talking about Jesus. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. And we are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. There it is. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, 
He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but you will now have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Just check this out. You've got to understand, this is like Thanksgiving dinner, uh, turkey and ham, okay? And you want to eat both of them. Because first he he, he outlines the fact that you are no longer subject to the penalty of sin. It's been acquitted. There was a court case, you were acquitted. You get to walk free, okay? It's like, anybody seen the movie Double Jeopardy? Jesus already paid for what happened. And you can go and do it again now. No, just joking. You can't do that. (laughs) He already paid for it. He paid for your sin. Even the things that you're going to do, He paid for them in advance. So so, so you're already acquitted. You're already free in the sight of Jesus Christ. But you can be free and still think like a slave. You ever ever realize that? You know, those people who are captive in their minds, still living under the power of sin. I, I heard at one time I had this guy come and sit with me and, in my office and he was, he was really a mess and uh, he'd been through some pretty crazy situations and he told me, Pastor, uh, I have a sex addiction. It's not my fault. I can't help it. And I was like, yo, have, have you read your Bible? Because you've read Romans 3, but you haven't read Romans 6. You know that you're free, but you're still using the word addiction like there is something that is holding you back to your old life. Romans 6 says that you have the power to decide that you are free, that, that you might be free, but your mind is still captive. You still think you're addicted. You still think you're struggling. You still think that you have no choice. Every choice is yours in Christ Jesus. So you have a choice to resist sin and use your body for the things of God. Because the power of God is, the power of the enemy is not on your life anymore. You're free. You're free. You're free. Look at your neighbor real quick. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Find, a, find your favorite neighbor. Find your other neighbor. Find the one that looks more friendly. Find the one that's not sleeping and say, hey, hey, wake him up, in fact. Now look back at him and wake him up. Just shake him. And say you've never looked so free. Never looked so free. And this is what's happening in Acts Acts 8, verse 7, in fact. You know the verse I read with the scary demon? Do you remember that? Were you hoping I would get there? Were you hoping I would talk about the demon that screamed as it left? Because they were doing this. They weren't just preaching about the penalties. They were setting people free. As they were preaching and performing miracles, it says, verse 7, demons left screaming. Demons love screaming. And, and I had people ask me, hey, Pastor, I went to Africa on a mission trip, and there's so much spiritual activity happening in Africa. It's amazing. How come that doesn't happen in the Silicon Valley? Now, I hate to burst your bubble, but it does. It happens in your workplace. Everyone's like going to walk into Monday, <laughs> like on a demon hunters or something. It happens on Sunday. It happens in church. But I don't like to, you know, I I know you, I I know, and and we don't usually use the word demon too much, and hardly ever do I stand up here and say, we're going to have some deliverance now, and some exorcism. Because I know 37% of you would leave. Because you're worried if pastor takes the demon out of them, it may get on me, and I don't want none of that. You know I'm preaching the truth. And the enemy's sneaky. He's so sneaky. He, he hides it in areas like the Bay Area, in Western culture. It's hidden. It's disguised. Still captive, but disguised. But we're, we're just as sneaky. We're just as sneaky as the devil. Don't you worry about that. He doesn't get all the sneakiness. We get sneaky as well. And instead of scaring you by saying, hey, we're going to deliver some people today. Anybody demon possessed here today? 
I say, anybody stuck? Anybody felt stuck? Felt stagnant? It's the same thing. Trying to get somewhere but feel like you're bound up. Trying to break free but feel like you're, you're dormant. Trying to get ahead but you feel like I'm stagnant in life and I feel like I can't move forward. Well, then let's pray and believe the power of God to set you free, which is to deliver you from the strongholds of the enemy that he's still trying to hold you back. And this is what the early church were doing. They were setting people free, releasing them into the understanding that the power of sin holds no strength over me anymore. And the reason that the demons screamed is they don't like giving up territory. They don't like letting believers get free. They're totally cool with believers knowing they're free from the penalty of sin. They really don't like believers getting free from the power of sin. Because when the believers know that they're free, free people, free people. And this is when the church becomes mobilized and starts to be a force to be reckoned with. So they will hold on. Convincing you that you're addicted, convincing you that you've got a syndrome, convincing you you've got a diagnosis. Anyway, he says this. It's that time. He says this. He, he says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's powerful. What he's talking about here is he said, I will give you the keys. And he gives us this illustration of keys, this picture of keys, that there is a key that you have been given by God to unlock and to release, that will unlock and release. And that's what keys do. Keys give access. Did you know that? They give access to things. Anybody ever tried to use a key that didn't work? Yeah. Felt like it fit, but it didn't unlock. Yeah. Feel like you're confused because it, it's meant to work, but it doesn't work. And you try for a long time, and then someone comes along and goes, oh, that's how you do it. And you're like, great. Yeah. Sometimes what it feels like to be a Christian. Yeah. Like, I know the keys. Yeah. So how do I do it? How do I work this thing? I sat last Sunday, I heard about the gifts of the Spirit, but how do I do it? I heard about unknown tongues and languages, but how do I do it? Yeah. Like I, I see it in the Word of God. If it's in the Word of God, that's great. I believe it, but how do I do it? Yeah. Like how do we use these keys? Like bind, great. Loose, awesome. But how do I bind and how do I loose? Well, it's important to know that Paul gives us some very clear instruction because the early church were in the same predicament as you and I. Where they had also just discovered these great gifts, this great authority, this great anointing that they had, but yet didn't know how to actually put it into practice. So Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he says this in 2 Corinthians uh, verse 4, uh, chapter 4, sorry, verse 3 to 4. And he, he paints a picture of who the keys are meant to be used on, because the first problem with the church using their keys is we're trying to use the keys on each other. <laughs> so we want to talk about this. <laughs> we're so busy trying to unlock stuff on each other, but you're already free. You're like, it's like key practice. <laughs> meant to unlock. But Paul wants to first make sure you know which things to unlock and which things to loose which things to bind. And so he writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it's hidden only from the people who are perishing. Satan, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. What he's trying to illuminate here is that is that there is a whole generation who are blinded. They, 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 they can't even understand why you do what you do. They can't understand why it is that you even go to church every Sunday. They're like, in their mind, they're like, you're crazy. Like you willingly go and you willingly sit in a service with other people you don't know. And on top of that, you give money. You're crazy. That's because they're blinded blinded. It's like a veil. You can't see it. 
They can't see it. They can't see it. They can't understand. They can't understand. Why would people do that? Why would people serve Jesus? Why would people serve this historical figure? Why? why, why? They can't see it. Paul wants to make sure they're the people you use the keys on. Yeah. And preceding that passage is a couple of verses earlier in 2 Corinthians uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, is exactly how he shows us how we're meant to use these keys. He says this, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us, everyone say us. us. All of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. I feel, just, just hold it for a second. He, he wants you to know that because you encountered Christ, that veil that used to be there, that made no sense to you why Christians do what Christians do, that, that, that thing that was foreign to you, now that it makes sense to you is because the revelation of Jesus Christ was illuminated to you, the veil was taken away and you saw, you understood. But not only did you see, you actually are being made more and more like God. So the way that we enact the keys of the kingdom or what gives access to the kingdom of God and into the fellowship of Jesus Christ is this understanding that God has actually called us as agents of Christ to walk in our freedom. Okay, stay with me. We are called to be free. In fact, the whole reason Jesus made you free is just so you can be free. Did you know that? Galatians 5.1 actually makes that really clear. Galatians, I've got to give you a scripture. Galatians 5.1. It's for freedom that Christ set us free. It's for freedom. For the fact, just to be free. But not just so that you can live in your freedom and enjoy the freedom of salvation, enjoy the freedom from the power of sin, enjoy freedom from the penalty of sin. But in your freedom, you have the freedom to be like Christ. As you reflect the glorious image of Christ, you are doing what Christ does. Remember in Luke chapter 4, he said that I came to proclaim freedom, to set captives free, to release the blind, to heal the poor. I, I came to do that. So when we actually walk in our freedom, we are being exactly like Christ. And what our name suggests, Christians, is exactly what we're meant to do. That we are meant to be like Christ or be like Christ-like in everything. Doing that is actually what unlocks the kingdom. The way you enact the keys of the kingdom is be Christ to a dying world, to bring freedom into a bound up world, to release captives. In fact, Paul says it this way. He says in 1 uh, Corinthians 11.1, 1, he makes it real simple. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah. Some of y'all don't even know how to be like Christ. So Paul says, I've written and made it plain in the Word of God. Just do what I tell you to do because I'm doing what God's told me to do. And if you do what God's called you to do, guess what? You are going to be like Christ, Christians, little Christ in this world. You are going to go through this world unlocking freedom in people's lives because of the freedom on you. And wherever the Spirit is, there is freedom. So what we realize is that my job is not to get more people into heaven. My job is to get more heaven into people. Because I'm meant to bring the freedom that is in heaven here into earth. I am an agent of the supernatural. There is two worlds in play. There is the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. And that's where the kingdom exists. But because I've been given the keys of the kingdom, I can bind on earth and bind in heaven. I can loose on earth and loose in heaven. And the Spirit of the Lord that is upon me, like Jesus preached, is the same Spirit that brings freedom wherever the Spirit is. So when I'm in your midst, when you walk into your workplace, when you walk into your family and you begin to speak under the power of the Holy Spirit, the freedom that's on your life begins to lift the veil and you begin to unlock the revelation of the same thing that Jesus did in you, the same thing God will do in me and watch as God will release people from their bondage. I just got to be like Christ. I just got to be like Christ. I got to be Christ-like. I got to be Christian. I got to walk like Jesus. I got to resist the devil. Yes, I got to choose to not sin. Yeah, I got to do all those things. But most importantly, I've just got to live in my freedom. As I live in my freedom, 
My freedom will set people free. As I don't live bound up, a slave to sin, a slave to shame, a slave to guilt, staying locked in the mentality of a slave as I step into my freedom each and every day, the Spirit of the Lord brings freedom. I'm out of time. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. This is the premise of the good news of the Jesus Christ is the whole idea that God wants is not that we would be Christians longing for the day where we get to go into heaven and experience freedom, that we would experience everything heaven has right here, that as believers, we would bring heaven to earth. It's how Jesus prayed. It's how He taught the disciples to pray. He was aligning their understanding of their mission. And I wanted so badly to pray for some people today where you're hearing about this freedom in Christ, but you have felt stuck. You have felt bound up. You have felt kind of like it's been hard for you to step into everything that God has for you. It's like, I need that freedom you're talking about, Pastor. So I want to pray for you. In fact, we're going to pray for everybody. If you would just close your eyes. In fact, if you want to experience the freedom of God's grace today, freedom from addiction, freedom from hurt, freedom from past. And you might want to ask me, how how will I know if I'm not free? Well, there's many different ways, but primarily it's hard to forgive somebody. That's generally the area in my life I know I get bound up. It's that area of forgiveness. And that's difficult and you want the power to do that. I'm going to pray for you too. So everybody who wants to receive this prayer for freedom right now, I want you to just go ahead and lift your hands to heaven. We're going to pray. God, you see every hand, every heart, every life. God, the power of freedom can flow right through their life. Lord, straight through the center of their world. Lord, that they would not just walk in freedom. Lord, they would just not understand they're free, but they would live free. They would bring freedom to others. That they would be a vessel for freedom. Lord, that you would flow through. And Lord, I pray that wherever they step, the presence of the Lord in their life would bring freedom into so many lives. So God, we pray that upon your church. And Lord, a church that is free can free people a church that is free is dangerous a church that is not bound up becomes very very dangerous to the kingdom of darkness and so God we pray the release of your power upon your people